Hello, I'm Ryan Mercer and welcome to the second episode of Build Back Liberal. This series explores how the Liberal Democrats can build a progressive centre-left agenda for the future. Joining me today is Julian Huppet, who is the former MP for Cambridge. Hello, Julian. Hi, Ryan. Good to hear you. See you. Your career is um, exhaustive, but if you could sort of give us a bit of detail about uh, who you are and sort of uh, why you're a Liberal Democrat, that kind of thing. Gosh, um, so I, I guess why am I Lib Dem is I, I, but I grew up knowing I was on the left of politics. Um, I grew up under Thatcher and I knew I wasn't on that side. Um, and so I think when I was sort of younger, I'd have probably, you know, I didn't really know what the differences were. Um, but it was actually when I was at school for various timetabling reasons. Um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would eat lunch while watching Prime Minister's Questions. And it was watching that or, or the discussion afterwards um, then that I realised I was a Liberal, but I agreed with the Lib Dem spokesperson pretty much routinely rather than the Labour. And that's when I started to realise there weren't just these two camps, there was a, a third option. Um, and so really, that, I mean, that's when I became uh, a Lib Dem. It turns out my parents were actually found the members of the SDP, but I actually didn't, didn't know that. Um, but it was it was very much that sort of realization that my my values those sort of internationalist you know small l liberal values were the values of a party and then so i got more and more involved at that point and actually joined the party before i could even vote and professionally your career was initially as a research scientist yeah. yes i worked on dna structure and function i mean i'm sure you know dna is a double helix it has lots of other shapes and those other shapes like four-stranded knots play a really important role in controlling how genes work so uh build back better how did you come to be involved with this and why is it so important um so i think the overall package is part of a, a number of things that we need as a party to really start articulating our values better you know i think we are a party that's full of, of policies we have no shortage of those but we're not always good enough at conveying the breadth of them in a way that's exciting and shows a strong vision uh, and so the idea of build back better was so look, let's take this moment and across the board come up with a narrative which is consistent coherent and exciting uh, so leila led that project with various others um, and it was a pleasure to be able to be part of it it's what i think we need so could you sort of outline what your contribution to build back better was about what your section of the book covers yeah so our section was about digital technologies um what do we think about those how, how are they changing our lives for good and for ill and as liberals what should we be doing about them um, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about this, but not much of it's informed and not much of it starts from a liberal perspective. Um, what is it that we think is the potential? What do we think are the harms? And how do we make the most of those? It's become particularly important now. I mean, you know, we're now spending so much more time digitally connected. You know, if you imagine what this pandemic would have been like without Zoom, without Netflix, without video calling so you could stay in touch with people, it would be a categorically different experience. So I thought it was quite now was a good time to, to pause and reflect on what was happening, where we needed to get to. So one of the uh, big themes in the chapter was about the a Digital Bill of Rights. Could you sort of outline what that is and why you think we need it? Yeah, so this is something that we started playing around with when I was an MP was the idea that we should set out what the rules ought to look like online. Um, and so we came up with uh, 13 points, which we thought were essential uh, to have. Um, so the first of these would be about control of personal data. You know, this has become a hugely important issue. It's much bigger now than it was then, as we see with Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and so forth. And, and there would also be limits on how personal data could be used. So control over content that you've put in, so an end to that, idea that once you've let Facebook have a look at your photo, it is Facebook's forevermore. Uh, we talk about a free and open internet, we talk about freedom of speech, we talk about privacy, we talk about surveillance, when it's acceptable, what the limits should be, consumer rights, freedom for encryption, the right to unrestricted internet access, a right to access and use of publicly funded data and research, we don't want to see walled gardens away from that, uh, digital literacy, which underpins all of this so that people can actually 
understand and control what they're doing. And lastly, a proper system for enforcement of digital rights, uh, because none of these rights matter if we have the sort of weak enforcement levels that, that exist at the moment. So what are the, you know, the, the internet and digital technology can be a great leveller that grants opportunities to people that don't exist uh, or they wouldn't have otherwise have access to for a whole host of reasons, where geography, disability or um, uh, just the limited opportunities that physical interaction can offer sometimes. But are there any particular risks of new inequalities or evolving inequalities that we need to be aware of in how we deal with the uh, increasing digitization of society? Um, absolutely, there are. And I think you ask a really good question because it looks at the role of technology in both improving existing problems and generating new ones. It's important to look at both of those. There's a sort of neo-Luddite approach which says that we shouldn't do anything unless it's only for the good. We have to accept that we have problems at the moment. We have regional inequalities, uh, for example. Um, but in terms of the harms that can happen, absolutely that. Just think of a, a school. Lots of pupils in a classroom, they all have equal access to uh, the learning that they're getting when they're sat in that classroom. There are challenges about whether they um, have had breakfast, for example, quite a serious challenge, but that can be fixed by breakfast clubs. It's easy enough to do. But you send them home and they're all in very, very different environments. Some homes will have nice high speed internet. They'll have their own device that they can do their lessons on and others will not have connectivity, will not have a peaceful environment, will not be able to get engaged in the same way. So we can massively worsen those inequalities. Areas which are unconnected, you know, many rural areas which still don't have decent connectivity, people will just be cut out completely uh, from that connection. So I think it's about provision of connectivity and it's about provision of data and access and dealing with the cost part of it. Um, if we can get that right, I think we can help. The other piece then is how people use systems. Some of us uh, love to live on a computer. I mean, I, the reason I don't spend my time on the computer or my phone the whole time is essentially because my eyes give way and I get fed up with it and it's nice to see the real world. But for other people, it's a new thing. And that will often be people who are, who are older, that they're not as comfortable with it, they don't get as much benefit. We have to make sure that if we come up with more digitally enabled services, for example, we don't end up saying to a lot of people, sorry, you cannot be part of this society. So what are the steps that we take there? There's also a number of issues with various different disabilities. And, and again, new digital services could be a wonderful way of helping people with disabilities not to have to deal with them. It's much, much easier to use a, a whole bunch of aids. But there are other sets of disabilities where it really can cut people off, particularly if the systems aren't designed well. I think that's really interesting. I It always strikes me that the generation that could benefit most from digital technology is older people, given that it can give them a degree of independence, you know, an ability to do their shopping without leaving the house and that sort of thing can be of hugely beneficial to, uh, you know, my grandmother is 88, she is very immobile, um, she hasn't progressed past, uh, we've got her a mobile phone, that is as far as she's got with technology uh even though her, she would benefit from it more for many aspects of life than i do uh, uh, absolutely i mean you know it, it's been it's been said by others that there's a real tragedy that the people who could benefit most from easy personalized transport systems and getting food easily delivered cooked to your door you know, our, our, our older people, you know, we have Meals on Wheels, which is an archaic version of this. We have various community mm -hmm. lift systems, which is an archaic version of this. And yet it's fit, healthy 20-somethings who are the <laughs> biggest users of many of these services. You know, we, we have ways of helping your, your, your grandmother and all sorts of others, but we haven't prioritised it. We haven't made it easy for them to use in many cases. One of the most recent and, and uh, ubiquitous uh elements of our changing society is social media and it's playing a bigger role in how we communicate how we access information what do we talking about really with relation to that in the in your section yeah so this is a really big issue so again i mean social media is a wonderful thing 
you know, the idea that we can communicate with people that we've lost touch with, that you can talk to experts, you can find out what's going on in niche areas that you're is wonderful. You know, there's never really been access to information like it. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the concept of social media. But we also, it comes with a whole lot of negatives. <clears throat> we see problems. I mean, I, I have a particular dislike of Facebook. I think Facebook, because of its system, is necessarily a problem. I don't feel the same way about other systems like Twitter. I think they can be problematic, but I don't think they necessarily are problematic. Um, and there's lots of different areas where we see this. You know, we see some of the trolling, we see some of the sort of group abusive behaviours, a whole lot of stuff which is, which is unacceptable. But there is also a thing which I guess you could technically call an epistemic threat. How do we know that information is reliable? Um, historically, how did you know that a story was trustworthy? Well, if it was published in a paper, there was reason to believe it to be true. It often wasn't, you know, whether it was in the Guardian or the Mail or the Times, there were errors, but there, were, there was an effort to reach standards. There was a named person or a named organization responsible for it. You had a reason to believe it. And you could distinguish quite well between a story printed in a paper or on the radio or on, you know, on television and what you heard from your mate in the pub. Everybody knew there was a difference in trustworthiness of those two different things. Social media changes that, makes it very, very hard to know whether a story is true. Very hard to know what the sources are. Uh, we don't know um, what, what, when you see something on social media referring to something, or referring to something, it's very hard to really chase that back down. And I think there's a real threat there to, to information. We don't know what's true. We, we can't, we, ha we don't have those sort of sources of, of veracity that we might, that we might want. And that then means that people behave in sadly a fairly predictable way. People believe the things which fit with what they would like to believe. When I see a story that says that somebody I don't like has done something silly, I'm more likely to believe it. When I see a story that says that somebody I really like has done something silly, I assume it's, a, it's fake news. I, I, I don't believe it. And so you end up polarising based on whether you believe the story because you'd like to believe it. And that's really problematic. So I think there's this epistemic threat, this threat to what is true. And I think that couples with various other behaviours to give this sort of polarisation that we see. And then it's very easy for stories to, to flood around true or false because they fit with what people would like to think. I think that's really interesting and uh, one thing when I speak to a lot of Liberal Democrats or progressive centre-left supporters is that they can't understand why people perhaps at the other end of the spectrum on the far right believe certain things and even when all the evidence seems to be against them and the reason is that they are finding their own evidence and that they're only uh, accepting new information that uh, reinforces their existing beliefs even when there's other evidence out there that shows that certain things are not true um, I think you know particularly thinking about the United States and, and the moment in particular there are lots of facts about say Donald Trump which we know full well but when they're heard over there they're assumed to be false because they don't match with people's pre-existing understanding so I, I agree with you. I think there's a bit of a danger in saying my side is the side which has all the true things in and the other ones are the ones who find their facts where they would like to. Um, because while I think my beliefs are right and I, you know, I, 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 I have some reason I think to, to do that, I do try and check, um, it sounds horribly like the same thing that somebody else could say in reverse. You know, um, I published a paper um, in Horizons with, with Ali Goldsworthy um, looking at polarisation and a very simple Bayesian model, like how, how do people behave? And we showed that you can get very clear polarisation um, without, you know, with each side believing that they are right and have checked their things. And they've, even if they read the other information and realise it's wrong, both sides will feel very strongly that they're right. So while well, to me, the Liberal case in the US, the Democrat case seems much stronger, 
I'm always a little nervous about casting it like that. Uh, but I think your general point is right. You know, but if you look around, you know, if you were a sort of neutral from outer space coming to have a look and you looked at Lib Dem voice, you would find a lot of people saying the same things that they believe because they've read it, because they're in that space. You could look at what a Labour blog, you'd look at a Conservative one, you could look at, you know, wherever you like. Uh, and while I do believe that Lib Dems generally are a bit more evidence based and a bit more sceptical, a bit more critical of these things, I'm not sure I could actually sustain that that is categorically true and that we are categorically different. So let's not use Lib Dem voice as the ultimate arbiter of truth is the message here. <laughs> well, I, uh, I generally believe we should not, not use anything as the ultimate arbiter of truth. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but, 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 I, but I think it, that, that's part of the problem is that you, 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 we have to always take people's word for things sometimes. You have to trust secondary or tertiary information <clears throat> because there's no way to do it otherwise. You know, we, we simply do not have time to evaluate every piece of information. I see a story on Twitter that says that Sage reported this and the Twitter report is quoting an article in the paper which quotes minutes which describes what Sage is. I, I believe that to be true. I could potentially go and check on the government website, I could go and see that, but I can't actually check that the government website is necessarily true. At some points, you always have to say, look, this feels broadly consistent. And if you're a sensible, rational person, you weight that a bit by how likely the thing was to be true. You know, if I read a story, it says that Ed Davey gave a powerful, impassioned speech about carers. I'm, I'm not going to do much verifying to check that that's true, because that's exactly the sort of thing that Ed would do. If I heard that Ed had done something very uncharacteristic, then I'm more likely to doubt the source and go, really? That doesn't quite sound right. And so we all question the things that don't feel right more often. That's sensible. It's how you try to make sure that you don't just always assume that, you're, that, that, that the things you believe will always be right. Was there anything else on the chapter that you wanted to cover particularly? We also wanted to think about when should you use digital things and when will they not work very well? And the nice way I think that we, we came up with to think about that was in terms of sensors. So if you think of the five-ish sensors that we all have, digital is really good at sight and it's really good at sound. If you're looking for an experience which just uses those two sensors, we can do that digitally already. If you're wanting touch, smell, taste, we're nowhere near. You know, there's, there's a few little things which slightly interact with that, but we just can't do it. So when you're thinking about which services should be provided digitally, a very simple classification. Are they on the um, sight sound side or the touch smell taste side? So if you are buying objects that you need to feel, doing them virtually will not work very well. There's still a role for shops, for example, on the high street. So if we're thinking about what the future of a high street should be, what the future of a city should be, we should think about what sensors we're engaging and therefore whether it needs to be in person or digital. So when you're a member of parliament, you were noted as one of the few scientists to have been a, in the chamber um, but you actually spent rather than talking a lot about that you really focused heavily on civil liberties issues and the role in which technology has been used to uh, surveil people and those kind of issues that are emerging um, what were some of the things that you were most concerned about and how have they panned out in the most recent years um so i think part of it is uh, that digital advances massively change the ability of people to surveil what we do. And that covers state surveillance, but it also covers surveillance by, by companies and by other individuals. You know, there's, it, it's not that one is good and one is bad. You know, as I've said before, I don't want the only people who can't read my emails to be GCHQ. You know, I, I, <laughs> I have no, no particular problem with them. Um, and it's just categorically different. So if you think about a heavily surveilled society like the Stasi in East Germany, you had to have a colossal number of people working for that organization to monitor. 
you know, the, the, I, I can't remember offhand, but it was something like one in a thousand people were doing that. You know, and if you count a wide broader, it's, it's sort of much higher figures. Similarly, uh, in the Soviet Union, similarly in any surveilled state, you have to have very, very large numbers of people. Digital changes that. Digital means that you can surveil people on a colossal scale, have massive interference with privacy, huge harms, very easily. You know, rather than listening into every phone call and writing down what was said, you can just record them all, potentially. So part of what I want to do is to say, look, things have changed. The rules, systems and protections that worked in the past simply don't operate when you can operate, when you can work on this colossal scale. And I think that's just become ever more so. Um, when I was uh, an MP, we were much more concerned about state surveillance because that was the first to go there. I think, um, although I did do a fair amount and write a bit um, about um, uh, the, uh, so I, I used to talk about three different categories of privacy violation, depending on consent. Um, and so there's one category where you, at least in principle, consented to share your data, like Facebook. You don't, it's actually not a legal requirement to use Facebook for anything. You, you, you don't have to be there. There's a second category where you don't consent, but society consents. So that's the state surveillance powers, for example. And, the, you know, and society's right to allow some of those, but what are the limits? And a third category, cyber criminality, for example, where, where there's no consent. And I think we focused a lot on that second category because it's the one where laws are most important. I increasingly think that all three of them are very important. There's a lot more cyber criminality than we really think about and accept. We've seen one a cry, but there's a lot more. Um, and I think we're now seeing the power and the power for harm of surveillance organizations like Facebook. Um, and that, that has grown and become much firmer than I thought it would do. Uh, the power that they have to abuse is shocking. And I have to say the limited reaction they're prepared to have to fight that is also quite scary. So in addressing this range of issues, where, what should the Liberal Democrats be looking at but yeah, where, where, where is the party in relation to the vision that we've, you've set out in Build Back Better? You know, what are the steps the party needs to go through now, do you think? Um, so I still think, as, I, as I've said earlier, um, that it's not about detailed policy. It's about saying what our principles are and what we believe. You know, we are a, a, a passionate, forward-looking, te technologically interested party. And so we should be clear about the huge benefits that digital can bring to all the things that we care about. It can be the great equaliser, providing education to the masses, providing right? opportunity to the masses, freeing people from, from you know, you know it, it, digital technologies are possibly one of the best ways to stop people being enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. You know, it, it, it's utterly fantastic. And we should advocate for that. But we should do so in a way which also talks about the problems that could happen on the way. There has been no innovation that has had zero harms. No, I think it's fantastic. You know, every time society has changed, there have been benefits, and there have been disbenefits. And I wouldn't say we should go back to a sort of, you know, the medieval era on the basis because things were certainly not better then. We have to talk about the positives. We have to think through what the negatives are going to be and how we mitigate them. We can't aim for zero negatives, but we can do what we can to mitigate those that there are and to make sure we don't leave people behind, that we, we put in extra policies to support those who would otherwise be hurt. So I am, I'm, I'm not a sort of Silicon Valley digital enthusiast of the sort of everything must be digital and that will be perfect. I'd like that to be true. And I think our job as liberals is to make sure that happens in a human focused and a society centric way. It would be strange to ignore the uh, elephants in the different rooms. Uh, I've not come to Cambridge to talk to you. We're doing this over Zoom. That is a symptom of the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. One of the big features of the government's response and governments around the world's response is the use of so technologies like track and trace and mass collection of personal data to mo monitor people's movements. 
Uh, this actually first started um, perhaps predictably in China with how they were looking at how they can manage the pandemic. It has been emulated around the world. Um, given that your expertise, both as a scientist, but also as a having spoken so much on these kind of issues in the past, how worried should we be about this kind of approach to handling uh, the pandemic? So I think the concept of track and trace the concept of being able to monitor people for good public health reasons is a really powerful one. You know, that privacy is important, but not dying of the virus is also quite important to me at least. Um, and so, you know, there are absolutely legitimate public health reasons for be, to be doing this. But that doesn't mean carte blanche to do absolutely anything. You can do track and trace in a privacy preserving way obviously can't be completely privacy preserving because at some point you want yeah. to contact people but in a way which is aimed to minimize the intrusion consistent with getting the best benefits you know that's that's how you should be trying to do it so for example the apple google uh, system is very well designed from a privacy perspective it will keep track of contact tracing of who you've been near in a way which minimizes the amount of information that leaks out you know, it's actually very, very well designed. And so, you know, I, 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 I've installed the new app. Lots of privacy campaigners have because it's a really good example of how to do that well. So we can do it well if you design carefully. On the other hand, there have been some utterly atrocious things. You know, some of the um, proposals from the original app that was, that was being designed by, by NHSX included keeping data on, on who you'd had interaction with for, I think it was something like 10 years. You know, there's no argument for that whatsoever. <laughs> you know, yes, it's important to know now whether I contract COVID from this other person. And I'm okay with keeping it for, let's say, a month. That's, you know, I could be argued around that sort of time frame. But the idea that in three years' time you'll need to know that I happen to have a drink with that person, uh, there's no public health reason for that. You know, that's not how this, this virus spreads. So you can do it well. I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing in the UK, you know, there are great examples around the world. New Zealand has got it fantastically well done, where they're interfering with privacy, but only to the level needed to protect people's health. I'm very up for that. Here, we spent a vast amount of money on a system that is not completely useless, but spectacularly poor. Um, is, you know, with the exception of the app, the whole system is not that well designed. Um, you know, so it's the, so track and trace, the idea, Absolutely. But any time you implement these things, you should think about how do you protect privacy? How do you think about the possible downsides at the same time as getting what you want to happen? Do you think there's any concern about uh, uh, whether the government's use of this kind of system normalises this kind of data collection and use of data by governments? Um, you know, are we see you know how, how do we be vigilant against a shift in that direction for perfectly legitimate reasons because of tackling the pandemic and because i think the i would imagine there's a real risk that the next step is well we have all this data or we have the means to collect all this data uh, we have other concerns like counter-terrorism and uh and uh, such that perhaps they that we've normalised this kind of data collection in a way that is uh, going to be an issue going forwards. And I think this is a very real concern, a very sensible concern. Um, and there are absolutely people who are using this crisis as an excuse to push all sorts of other things they've wanted to do for a long time. Every time you hear people say, look, identity cards are the answer. You know, some of us think, well, they've been the answer to all sorts of things. They've never actually been the answer to any of them. You know, and, and there is absolutely a set of people who will say, look, this shows that we need to keep data on everybody. Um, I think we have to just be robust about that and what our reasons are. You know, because there are people who will always advocate for saying, oh, but we have to do this because of child protection, because of terror, because of some awful thing. And these are all really important issues. But none of them mean that you say, and that trumps everything else that could possibly be there. So, and I think actually because for a whole bunch of reasons, many of the proposals wouldn't actually help the things they say they would actually help. You know, if you take counter-terror, um, if you look at the terrorist incidents that we've had in the UK, in almost every single case, uh, the perpetrators have been known to the security service already. They've been so overwhelmed by information, they haven't been able to act. You know, if you're looking for needles in a haystack, throwing a lot more hay in 
doesn't help in the slightest. It just makes the problem worse. So we do have to be vigilant about that. Um, but it's also why we should be saying at the moment, what are the good ways to do these things and what are the bad ways to do these things? The you know, I, I, I've been a great advocate for privacy preserving technologies where there are ways of collecting the information that you need with minimal uh, invasion. Um, and so there are some lovely tools that are being developed. So Yoti, for example, have a nice app. Um, so if you need to demonstrate uh, that you are entitled to go into a pub at, at the age of, you know, because you're 18 or something, you'll often have a card or have lots of information about you. It has your name, it may have your, it probably has your address, has all sorts of other information about you. That's not needed. What's needed is a robust thing to say that you, the person, is entitled to come into this pub. They don't need to know your birthday. They don't need to any of that. They just need a, the minimal information. And there are nice tools now where you can have something which associates a person with a right to do a particular thing at a particular time. And that's all the information that's needed. And that's really quite powerful. Um, you know, your driving license, if you have one, says where you were born. You know, of what possible use is that if the police stop you to find out whether you're allowed to drive this large metal vehicle? <laughs> they don't need to know that. So you can, if you push on privacy preserving technologies, you just display the information that's necessary. The Apple Google system is really good at doing that. And I think we should be using this as a way of saying, look, we can do a lot of public good without causing the harms to privacy and, and, and various other things. Um, we should focus very, very hard on doing that. So there is, across the Atlantic, uh, a somewhat important political event going on right now, and it seems remiss to completely ignore it, um, given we're filming this in October. Um, we, we could talk about the US election for many more hours as well. So what I'm asking each person I'm interviewing is to give me one message, lesson, thing that you've noticed about what's happening over there that we either as Liberal Democrats or as the UK should be taken away from it? Um, so I think the problem, the, the thing that's happened in the US and the thing that terrifies me is the complete polarisation to the extent that it's dehumanising of the other. Um, and this was really brought home to me when, uh, um, I've forgotten her name, former Arizona Congresswoman who was shot, Gabby, Gabby Giffords? Gabby Giffords. Was? Yeah. So she went to Obama's State of the Union, fresh out of hospital. Um, and she wanted to stand for some of the things that he said. And her neighbour was a Republican congressman. And he helped her to her feet for those things. He wasn't standing himself, he didn't agree with them but he helped her to her feet so that she could. And he got lambasted for helping a Democrat, for helping Obama, when he was doing something which, you know, you'd think would be praiseworthy to all sides, you know, a very responsible, respectful thing. And that idea that those who disagree with you are evil, is a really toxic thing. It starts in the US, but you see it coming here, you know, and you see it from, from Labour and the Conservatives, you know, from, you do see it from Liberals as well, that there are people who are, you know, if they are Conservative or they hold a different view to yours, they are, they're not just, you know, being, thinking they're wrong, fine, thinking they don't have the right ideas, fine, but they are by definition evil. Um, and you see it in lots of things, you know, the sort of, um, I've never kissed a Tory badges that were going around. Like, don't care if you have or not. Like, you know, they're human beings. I disagree with, with, with the huge amounts of conservative policy. But if we move, if we follow the US and go down that route that the others are evil, I don't think there's a good solution. And so I actually think it's hugely, hugely important as liberals and actually as everyone in the UK, that we do open ourselves to the idea that people who have different views from ours are not evil. They may be wrong. We may be able to explain why we think what they, what they propose is not a good idea. But once you dehumanise political opponents or any sort of opponent, that is a route to utter catastrophe. Thank you so very much, Julian. That was... Uh really uh, interesting and uh, lots for, I think, anyone listening to think about. Um, 
in you know throughout this uh series we're thinking about uh what the direction of a party in the future and i think all of these issues are going to become know, they've be got become steadily more important over time then that's not going to change that direction of travel is not going to change so it's sort of shaping our vision for the part of the country whether it's economic or social uh increasingly these ideas are going to be central to that rather than something that we see as a separate thing or an afterthought in some way so i really do appreciate your time for this thank you so very much always a pleasure thank you for listening to build back liberal please comment below with any thoughts or ideas about what you've heard and anything else we could be looking at on this podcast next time i'll be joined by emily smith the leader of vale of whitehorse council until then, take care and stay safe.